quick disclaimer. Everything in this video and all of my videos are my opinion based on detailed research that I perform. That said, I would recommend doing your own research before you make up your mind. Thank you. As a woman, I should be overjoyed that Meghan Markle is putting out content on a weekly basis, sitting down with prominent women, addressing all the labels, or as she calls it, archetypes that are holding women back. But I'm not. And it's because I don't agree with what she has to say. Meghan's entire brand is built on wanting to further women's rights. At the foundation of this brand is Meghan's favorite story of how she single-handedly convinced a dish soap brand to change the wording in their national ad campaign. When I was just... 11 years old, I unknowingly and somehow accidentally became a female advocate. When I'd seen the ad for Ivory Clear dishwashing liquid, and when I heard those boys and their idea for what my future might hold, I knew something was just wrong. And I knew I had to do something about it. So I was wondering if you would be able to change your commercial to people all over America. Thank you, Meghan Markle. And would you believe it? Three months later, a new version of the ad appeared on TVs all around the country. The gloves are coming off. People are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clean. Funnily enough, the story and Megan's retelling of it is the perfect showcase of why I have a problem with Megan's podcast, but I'll come back to this point later. Let's start with the philosophy that Megan is trying to disseminate. On her podcast, she discusses different labels that get used against women to effectively hold them back. She opens with that dirty, dirty word. Dirty dirty word. Ambition. And to break down this absolutely filthy word, she brings on her show one of the greatest tennis players of all time. Serena Williams, my dear, dear friend. Wait, Megan, how do you know Serena again? My friend, Serena Williams. My friend, Serena. My dear, dear friend. She's my friend. Ah, okay. Right off the bat, there is a problem. Can you see what it is? Serena Williams is solid, undeniable proof against Meghan's argument that society doesn't like ambitious women. After all, Serena has been vastly successful. She's won 23 Grand Slams against other successful female tennis players. She won her first Grand Slam 23 years ago at the age of 17. She has the highest all-time WTA career earnings of 94 million, with the runner-up being her own sister, Venus, at 42 million. Serena has been the face of so many brands, and has had a successful clothing line and has invested in over 66 startups. My point of sharing all these stats is to clearly showcase that Serena's ambition has not been a problem. No one has insisted that she quit playing and get back in the kitchen and make her husband a sandwich. In fact, she has been rewarded for her ambition, her hard work, her talent, and her determination. The examples that Megan and Serena did use that showed society's discomfort with ambitious women was the fact that people asked Serena what it was like to juggle motherhood with her demanding career. A reasonable question, as even Serena noted, since it is women and not men who have to breastfeed their children. Child rearing, especially in the early years, is harder on women than on men. That is a fact. So what exactly is wrong with people showing consideration for the strain that motherhood puts on professional women and asking them how they're managing it? I mean, Serena is retiring early so she can focus more of her time on expanding her family, clearly showing how hard it really is to juggle the two, something that is a biological constraint and not a societal one. During the podcast, Serena told a truly inspiring story of how she stayed up all night to comfort her injured daughter and then went on to play the next day despite only getting 30 minutes of sleep. And you know what? She won. That's amazing. Like, I look at my mom. I don't know how she had five kids. I don't know. Like, I... I but you are such an amazing mom. And that kind of story... And I would drop anything at any time to whatever I had to do for Olympia. Wait, I wonder if Megan will feel threatened by Serena's wonderful story of perseverance and will want to jump in. So when you went and played that match the next morning, no one knew what your night had been like the night before. They forgot that human piece of it. Yeah. Just like when we went on our tour to South Africa. Yep, right on cue. We landed with Archie. Archie was, what, four and a half months old? Drop him off at this housing unit that they had had us staying in. We immediately went to an official engagement in this township called Nyanga. We finish the engagement, we get in the car and they say, there's been a fire at the residence. What? There's been a fire in the baby's room. 
I love that Megan takes this moment to tell a story about having to go on to an engagement after a supposed fire in the nursery, but it turns out it was just a smoking heater. Oh, what would Megan do if she didn't have the big bad royal family to use as a scapegoat in her I'm such a victim stories? And of course, as a mother, you go, oh my god, what just, are you? everyone's in tears, everyone's shaken. And what do we have to do? Mm. Go out and do another official engagement. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. Can you just... <sighs> How did you not bring him? I was like, can you just tell people what happened? And so much, I think, optically, the focus ends up being on how it looks instead of how it feels. And part of the humanizing and the breaking through of these labels and these archetypes and these boxes that we're put into is having some understanding on the human moments behind the scenes that people might not have any awareness of and to give each other a break. Because we did. We had to leave our baby. Now, what does any of this have to do with ambition? Well, I'm not really sure. Megan says that apparently people in the workplace reward men for having children while penalizing women, furthering the point that any choices women make are unacceptable to society. Serena talks about how at the US Open, she was often penalized for being argumentative when it was perfectly acceptable for men in tennis to act out. And this really highlights my major issue with this podcast since both Megan and Serena see the world from race and gender tinted glasses. Every story Megan tells or invites her guests to tell has a loud proclamation of how the world is entirely too racist and too sexist. And that's the perspective she's ultimately selling. When the truth is that there is so much more to any story, so much more to people's motivations than just sexism or racism. Maybe a woman isn't succeeding at work because of her work ethic. Maybe people don't like her attitude or her overbearing demeanor. But if she defaults to the boy who cried wolf strategy of calling out racism and sexism every time something doesn't go her way, she's never going to be able to see the true cause of falling behind professionally. But that is part of the strategy, isn't it, with this sort of belief system, to completely avoid seeing your own flaws. During the podcast, Serena complains about how she was penalized for her behavior many times while she played in the US Open, and now suffers from trauma as a result. Both she and Megan indicating that it's because men find any aggressive behavior from women uncomfortable. Here they share the example of a 2004 quarterfinal where Serena's balls were erroneously called out multiple times, and everyone would agree that she behaved appropriately in response because it was unfair. Fair. And even the commentators were siding with her the whole time. Let's say that ball was out. What? What? That ball was out. I thought it was no good. Way. No way. That wasn't even close. Well, Serena agrees. Okay, I thought I was nuts for a moment. That was wow. not even close. Serena's going to come right over to talk to the chair. I. That was way in. John. That was way in. I always defer to you on these things. I thought it was good. Excuse me? This is crazy. Well, that's not even close. I mean, that's not even close. Okay, hang on. Megan would like to say something. And look, there's something that happens in being archetyped that's really dehumanizing. And I think of that from my personal standpoint of being there in the box with your, you know, your mom and your sister and like watching you win. And at the same time, watching the pressure, the external pressure that I knew was mounting when we'd be at the Open or when we'd be at Wimbledon. Yeah. And knowing that there's a real person behind all of that, I find it traumatizing, too, to, to go back to that moment. Okay, thank you for that, Megan. The story Serena and Megan don't recount that is actually a better display of her aggression is during her 2009 match where she threatened a lines person. And you know what? I'm not even going to say anything. Just see for yourselves. So if she gets a warning, it's point penalty, game, set, match. Now, I really don't think it's fair to default to racism and sexism in this situation when you can see that most of the key decision makers are women. After Serena goes up to a poor Asian woman and told her she would hit her, her only justification is that people have said way worse. But it's not just Serena who has been called out or penalized. There are several instances of men facing the same consequences for similar behavior. Men too get asked stupid questions and provoked by the press. Men too are part of games where lines people erroneously call the balls out. And you know what? The US Open has laid off 250 
50 line judges and replace them with an automated system. Now, I'm not saying racism and sexism don't exist. They do. But are they as rampant as several unbelievably successful women of varying backgrounds are making it seem? I mean, isn't their success a testament to how fair the world has become? And perhaps these women can showcase how they have become successful, what principles have helped them become successful, and share those with the young women listening to their podcast instead of constantly pointing out how the glass is half empty and the world just ain't fair. Megan clearly doesn't want to be called specific words like ambitious or lucky for marrying a prince or a diva by Mariah Carey. Wait, Megan, didn't you call Mariah Carey a diva? What she doesn't mind, however, is when people come up to her and call her a princess, as she shared during her interview in The Cut. Even if she and Harry have stepped back from their royal duties, Megan is still aware that people see her as a princess. It's important to be thoughtful about it because even with the Oprah interview, I was conscious of the fact that there are little girls that I meet and they're just like, oh my god, it's a real life princess. Let's not forget that she especially hates it when they forget to refer to her as the Duchess of Sussex. Hey, hey, did you know Archie and Lily don't have titles? Yeah, I know. Do you mind? I'm actually in the middle of work. You know who does have a title? Is it you? Yeah, me. And you may now only refer to me as Lady Baggage Queen. I am now the proud owner of land in Scotland. Oh, isn't it wonderful? I'm gonna build the largest castle this world has ever seen. And I'm gonna go out on the balcony and stare out at all the plebes and watch them go about their humdrum lives as they toil and work to pay the taxes to their new lady. Okay, so you own land? Uh-huh. In Scotland? Uh-huh. How big is it? Um, uh, it's like one by one square foot. No big deal. Wow, that's gonna be one very tall castle. I think you're talking about established titles. You, you know you can't build on that land, right? Instead, you're buying land to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland and helping global reforestation efforts. Do you understand? Lady Baggage Claim, do you understand? Okay, you know what? I'm gonna take over this ad read. Established Titles is a project based on a Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. Title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland. Established titles are committed to planting a tree with every order, so it's a fun novel way to help preserve the picturesque woodlands and biodiversity of Scotland. In exchange, you can call yourself a lord or lady and even get it on your credit card or plane tickets or sign birthday cards. That way, friends and family know how superior you really are. And you can even put it on your dating profile. Yes, and it makes for an amazing last minute gift. Established Titles is actually running a massive sale right now. Plus, if you use the code BAGGAGECLAIM, you get an extra 10% off. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking distance. So you'll be able to see my magnificent castle. There isn't going to be a castle. You know what? I'm getting really tired of you crushing all of my dreams. Okay, when have I ever done that? Like the time I wanted to keep killer bees in the backyard. You wanted to keep killer bees in the backyard. Yeah, I was planning to train them to hurt our enemies. That is the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard. You're welcome, by the way. I was only looking out for you. You're the one with the enemies, not you me. You never support okay, anything let's that ignore that and uh, we're back. Well, back to Megan and the archetypes that she loads. Megan is pushing for over positivity, something that Hollywood just loves. So much so that nausea is a common side accompanying any conversation between two celebrities. Whether it's Megan and her guests caught in eternal loops of telling each other how amazing the other is, or Harry affirming that Megan, in fact, can be a model so he can, quote, earn himself so many points. Megan's podcast is a showcase of how she wants the world to engage with her, with saccharine and sycophantic compliments please. And you might say, what is wrong with being positive and complimenting people? Well, the concern is that are we all so interested in being positive that we sacrifice the idea of honesty? Maybe being a diva where you're absolutely unbelievably overbearing in your demands is not a good thing for your career. Maybe someone like Mariah Carey can pull it off since she has, after all, earned her place with an illustrious career, but would not be a great behavior to emulate for other less established women. Maybe some women are overly ambitious 
this, a polite word used instead of calling them social climbers, because they are willing to use anyone and discard them as they make their ruthless climb up the social ladder. Behavior we really don't like in men either, since it's manipulative and generally despicable. Maybe some women are crazy, just like some men are crazy. The Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial went a long way in showing us the depths of how crazy Amber Heard truly was, where she was willing to ruin a man's reputation by falsely accusing him of domestic abuse after abusing him for years, and not to mention the literal excrement in the bed situation. I can't believe I have to say this, but just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you're free from any criticism from society. And it doesn't mean you are just inherently a good person. Or if you do something bad, it's because you're a victim of society. People will call you things. They will use labels you don't like. Sometimes it will be warranted and sometimes not. And instead of insisting that everybody else stop, how about we teach women to see the difference between reasonable criticism to consider and mull over and irritating insults that need to just roll off your shoulders? What I loved about the conversations with Mariah Carey and Mindy Kaling is that they refuse to play into any victim narratives. They are both hardworking winners, and that was clear. Nothing was going to stop them, not even phrases like diva or old maid. Both of them are completely unbothered by how people are choosing to label them. And that's for one simple reason. They're not looking for control. Whereas for Meghan, control is the mission. From choosing to leave the royal family to her sit-down with Oprah and now to her podcast, Meghan is motivated by her desire for control. She wants a vice-like grip on her public image. Since her podcast is called Archetypes, let's talk about an archetype that Megan is not likely to mention, and that is the persona. According to the eminent psychoanalyst Carl Jung, the persona is one of the four archetypes of the psyche and can be best explained as masks we wear when we're engaging with the world. Now, the idea of wearing a mask sounds bad, but it's really not. For example, if you're grabbing your daily morning coffee at Starbucks and the barista asks you, how are you? Thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm okay. You're not gonna say, not great, my dog died and my cat is the one who killed him and now I'm afraid he's going to kill me too. No, there's a long line of dangerously undercaffeinated patrons lined up behind you, all of whom are also worrying about their homicidal cats. So you say, I'm fine, thank you, and move the hell on. That is your persona that you put on because not every aspect of yourself is appropriate for every situation. And our personas are developed through socializing with people. This is why I find the phrase, I don't give a damn what people think about me, utter rubbish. We all know you care what people think. And you know what? That's perfectly okay and actually healthy to a point. I mean, it's not good for you to be so obsessed with what people think of you that you forget to create a life that you actually like. And it is very unhealthy to not care a damn about what other people think. We are social creatures and we determine how to behave using social cues. Nothing wrong with that. So our persona is our version of the appropriate way to behave in situations. At work versus at home, with your friends versus with your parents, with your boss versus your employee. These are all based on social cues that we have received over our lifetime. Another word for persona might be decorum. What is the appropriate way to represent oneself in society. But a person can also have an unhealthy persona. This typically occurs when people themselves buy too much into their persona and don't acknowledge the other aspects of their psyche, specifically their shadow. This is the part of you that's capable of doing bad things. Maybe you present yourself out in the world as a patient, caring, empathetic person, and your soft outer shell is to cover your even softer, gooey inner self. But really, when no one consequential is looking, you're capable of anything, like bullying your staff and terrorizing your three-year-old niece. So you might ask, what does a faux persona have to do with Meghan Markle? An interesting pitch that Meghan made when promoting her new podcast was that people should expect the real me in this and probably the me that they've never gotten to know, certainly not in the past few years. Hey, it's me. Yeah, it's fun. She also said in her interview with The Cut, it's like, I'm finding, mm, not finding my voice. I've had my voice for a long time but being able to use it. But I would wager that when Meghan was part of the royal family and silent... Were you silent or were you silenced? silent, it was much better for her public image. Royal duties involve showing up to your engagements and going about your work. And the palace do their best to limit the royals' overexposure so as not to create scandals and rumors. A great example of this is the late queen, who never sat down to any interviews and instead remained steadfastly focused on her duty to her people, keeping any chatter about her personal life to a minimum. This understanding translates into the palace's steadfast refusal to address rumors when stories inevitably do 
a rise in the media, since it only serves to fan the flames. Guess who never liked that strategy? Like I said earlier, Megan wants to control her public image. She wants to be presented as a philanthropic, effortlessly stylish, publicly put-upon princess. And no deviations from this persona will do. Unfortunately for Megan, she is a money-motivated, merching tryhard that has, on her steadfast way up to the top, mistreated and outright bullied enough people that no one is buying that sweet girl act anymore. The more access we have to Megan, like we have had with this podcast and the several interviews she's done, the more we can feel in our bones that she is putting on an act. There isn't a single moment from her that feels genuine, that doesn't feel very directed by her internalized bachelor producer. But Megan is defaulting to the only strategy that has ever worked for her, playing up her victim card. Every interview, every speech, every podcast episode is another opportunity to talk about how she was a princess locked up in a tower and is now working on healing. But like her detergent story from the start of this video, no one is buying that tired old tale anymore. Megan's public persona has cracked. And people have seen that the real Megan that she keeps trying to sell is nowhere near the shrewd, calculating, and power-hungry woman she truly is. And no amount of guilt and sprinkled in victim narratives is going to change that fact. The truth is that Megan isn't really aiming to help women. After all, all of her examples of ways that women are being held back are so outdated, where she's literally using examples from decades ago like Austin Powers, Scrubs, Mash, and Kill Bill. So again, despite being a woman who wants other women to succeed in this world, why am I so against Meghan Markle's podcast? It's because of the answer to one question. What is Meghan trying to sell the women listening? As I see it, she is wholeheartedly trying to convince us that we are oppressed, ill-treated, and generally just suffering at the hands of a society designed by and for men. And that is not true. As of September 2022, there are 28 countries with women as heads of state and or government. And there are 41 women who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies at the moment. In 2016, that number was 21. And the United Kingdom just laid to rest one of the most inspiring queens the world has ever seen. Serena Williams is worth 260 million. Mariah Carey is worth 320 million. Mindy Kaling is worth 35 million. We women are not oppressed. We're not victims of our society. And we should not let someone sell us that narrative so that they can capitalize on our supposed victim status to garner attention and influence. And that brings us back to the story of how Megan got Procter & Gamble to edit their national ad. A lie that unfortunately, as both Tom Bauer and Lady C have confirmed, her father Thomas Markle encouraged Megan to believe in order to empower his young daughter. And a story that Megan in her 40s is still hanging on to because that is the persona that Megan has been trying to cement publicly with all of her might. Megan wants to be seen as the ultimate victim and the ultimate savior at the same time. But unfortunately for her, the closer we look, the more we can all see that she's not real. Everything she has represented is not real. We have probably never even met the real Meghan Markle. Thank you for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, Baggage Claim merch is no longer just a dream, but now a reality. So go check it out. Link is in the description. And a big thank you to Established Titles for sponsoring this video. Please check out their title packs for a great way to support reforestation efforts since Established Titles work with wonderful charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.